of the Law School, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our third annual International Trade Conference. And this is becoming a great tradition. We have been very blessed to have so many judges from the U.S. Court of International Trade with us coming every year, and um, we have them come during the year for lectures as well. Um, and over the last couple of years, we've created a really good pipeline of our students doing judicial clerkships and externships with that court. Many of them have then gone on to the Commerce Department or jobs at some of the big law firms that do international trade. And it is wonderful for this law school to be building up its international law trade practice. Um, we are a law school that has been known for our international law program for quite a long time. 27 years ago, the Gunn Foundation gave us a $3 million endowment to start up the largest endowed international law trade center, or international law center in the country. And um, our colleagues from all the other law schools rank us every year. We've been ranked among the top for the last 15 years. This year, we're ranked number 14 in the US News rankings. Um, our trade area of our practice in our program is organized uh, and led by our wonderful professor, who I think all of you know, Juscelino Colares. What you might not know was that I, many years ago, was chair of the hiring committee when we recruited Professor Colares. And since then, he's done amazing things for this school. Um, this past year, he won the award that we give for the faculty member that has distinguished themselves in publishing over the last three years for his wonderful publications. He also just um, ended his term as chair of the university faculty senate, which he did very well. And he is the associate director of our Cox International Law Center. And he is the one who organizes this particular conference every year. And we are very, very happy and lucky to have him with us. And without further ado, let me turn things over to Professor Kolaris. <clears throat> well, good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, Case Western Law's uh, third international law follow-up uh, follow update. We all knew that uh, the trade system was due to some sort of rebalancing away from runaway, unchecked uh, cosmopolitanism, but uh, boy, are, have we gotten it. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, so we're here to talk about uh, events on trade and customs law. Uh, it's a practitioners-oriented conference, and we wanted to do something different, where we get uh, the people who are uh, uh, in the trenches and people who are thinking also about the big questions on trade together uh, for one day, uh, along with providing an opportunity for the students to meet in the afternoon and, and, and not only follow the conference, but ask their very precise questions of how do I do this? So uh, that, that was the idea that we developed. Again, my name is Juscelino Colares, I'm your host. So before we begin, I must recognize a few individuals who helped me put together this conference. First, the Honorable uh, Claire Kelly, uh, US, U.S. Court of International Trade Judge, whom I will introduce to you soon. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with you in preparing and uh, uh, our upcoming roundtable. Second, I must recognize Judge uh, Leo M. Gordon for helping me both conceive and populate uh, this morning's panels w on trade and customs law. And uh, third, I must uh, thank Amy Porges uh, for, uh, and Larry Friedman for chairing the trade and customs panels that you are going to see following our my, uh, my Judge Kelly's and mine uh, roundtable. And uh, fourth, I want to thank uh, Luke Tillman, Brendan Saslow, and Zach Walker, our precious alums, uh, for coming here and giving back to our law school by talking to our students this afternoon in the non CLE portion of the program about uh, forging a path in international uh, trade in the international trade field. Finally, I want to express my gratitude to our sponsors, to Dean to Dean Scharf, to our sponsors, ASIL, SITBA, uh, the Customs and Interna in International Trade Bar Association, the Greater Cleveland uh, International uh, Lawyers Group and Grunfeld uh, Desiderio LP, uh, who all uh, so uh, generously helped us uh, put this conference together. At Case Western, I have sought to teach my students the procedural and administrative aspects of trade law, which I most certainly lacked when joining uh, Dewey Ballantyne as a trade associate over a decade and a half ago. And my colleague here, John Bone, who was a senior associate at the time at Dewey, uh, probably can testify to that. 
So last year, in my introductory remarks, I spoke about the jurisdiction of the U.S. Court of International Trade. This year, I decided to speak less and give Judge Kelly more time for remarks on jurisdiction and procedure at the CIT. Uh, Judge Kelly is a big fan of procedure. Uh, just a second. She's a big fan of procedure like I am. Hopefully, she will be more, way more interested on procedure than uh, I could ever uh, be. She was appointed to the United States Court of International Trade by President Barack Obama in 2013. Prior to becoming a judge, she was a tenured professor at Brooklyn Law School. Uh, she received her BA cum laude uh, in 1987 from Barnard College and her JD magna cum laude in 1993 from Brooklyn Law School. As an academic, she was elected member, uh, an elected member of the American Law Institute and served as co-chair of the International Economic <laughs> Law Group of the American Society of International Law. And I've heard from several people that she did a terrific job on putting together uh, uh, instructions on how, on a, a handbook on how lawyers should pursue a, a TAA a trade adjustment assistance cases and that proved to be extremely helpful clearing out a, a major backlog of things and that is a, a, an incredible service. So uh, since joining the bench, Judge Kelly has, grown great, uh, has shown great dedication as she had during her life as an academic to public service and to the court. Without further ado, I give you United States Court of International Trade, Claire R. Kelly. Over there. Yeah. Yeah. Here's your watch. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very grateful to Professor Kolaris uh, to have the opportunity to speak with you and to speak with him. Uh, we share many of the same interests, so this will be fun. Um, I have to give the usual disclaimer that my comments are my own and uh, I certainly do not speak for the court as a whole or any of my individual colleagues. Uh, when we were talking about uh, this conference um, and uh, thinking about practice and being in the trenches, I offered to speak about jurisdiction and procedure, two of the things that uh, I really love and, um, and that I deal with uh, day to day. Um, and so I went through and uh, said, I'll pick out some of the big procedure and uh, jurisdiction cases that happened in the last year or so, and maybe we'll just talk about those. So I, I prepared some remarks on those, and I uh, sent it to Professor Kolaris and um, had him take a look, and he was happy. And um, then I kind of did a dry run, a practice of it, and it goes about an hour and a half. So um, I said, well, I guess uh, a lot happened, but I'll tr so I'm just going to, I'm just really just trying to hit the big points, and then we'll have a little bit of a discussion afterwards. Um, I wasn't going to tell the judge to uh, keep it. Right, right. That's, you know, that's the problem of becoming a judge is that all your jokes are funny um, and nobody ever tells you to stop talking. Um, so um, I'm also very happy to be here because uh, I miss teaching and um, I know that there are a lot of students here and I love coming to things where you uh, meet students and get to tell them about what you do. And so with that in mind, I know there are a lot of wonderful people from practice, who some of whom are here that I've known for over 20 years. Uh, but I'm going to give a little bit of a 10,000 foot level approach for the people who don't know this field as well as you do. So if you need to check your email, I won't be offended if your thumbs are moving while I give the beginning part here. Um, so um, just to give you a, uh, an overview of what we do at the CIT. So uh, the CIT is an Article III court. Uh, the judges are appointed uh, by the president, confirmed by the Senate. We have a complement of nine active judges, or by statute we are to have a complement of nine active judges. Currently we're down two, um, but it's my understanding that there are two nominees, so um, maybe something will come along soon. We also have uh, four active senior judges, so um, those colleagues uh, take cases. They may or may not take a reduced caseload. <coughs> I personally am very grateful, though, um, for, their, um, for their service and continuing to take cases and for their collegiality because we are, we are very busy. Um, we have jurisdiction, our jurisdictional statute, um, 1581 and 1582. Um, 1581, for the students, involves uh, suits against the United States. So um, it's a party suing the United States for some reason. There are, there are 
jurisdiction subsections A through I. But there are several big subsections that we hear a lot. So A jurisdiction is protest jurisdiction. So uh, that's a fair amount of our jurisdiction. That's when um, an importer is um, suing because of the denial of a protest. Now, the there's a separate statute that says what you can protest. So you have to have something that you can protest. But if you protest the decisions of customs, say for classification or valuation, um, and that protest is denied at the agency, you can challenge that at the Court of International Trade. And that has been a part of our jurisdiction, a big part of our jurisdiction, I should say, for a long time. Um, there are some other provisions. You mentioned the TAA. Um, uh, some. Uh, provision regarding broker's license under subsection G, some other provisions that are um, less common and we don't have too much time to go into them, so I, so I won't. Another subsection though that is a big chunk, probably the biggest chunk of our jurisdiction is subsection C. So those are the trade remedies cases, right? Those are anti-dumping and countervailing duty. That's when you have a determination made by an agency, the ITC or the Commerce Department, um, there's an entire huge uh, administrative proceeding that goes on. That proceeding has a determination, and then you can challenge that determination, parts of that determination, in our court. Those are the C cases, um, and that is probably the largest piece of what we do. Um, and then another piece worth mentioning are the I cases. Those are the residual jurisdiction cases. Now, I should say that in order to be an I case, you can't have been any other kind of case, right? So you can't be an I if you could have been an A, right? So it's not just a basket, I didn't get into court the way I should have, and now I want to be an I case. It's residual jurisdiction. It covers things that are connected with um, uh, the import laws, so things like embargoes, or um, um, uh, revenue from imports or uh, um, customs, uh, I'm sorry, revenue from uh, uh, duties and tariffs that are non-revenue. And it covers the administration enforcement of all the matters in the prior subsection. So um, the interesting thing about I is there's often uh, litigation over whether it is an I because people try and get into the court by saying, okay, well, I'm not in one of these provisions, A, C, uh, D, but I'm an I, so let me in under I. And so then you see some jurisdictional cases come out of that. The other uh, jurisdictional statute, 1582, are suits by the U.S. against someone. So there you're going to have your cases to recover civil penalties, to recover on a bond, and to recover customs duties. Um, now, I'd come prepared with a list of stats about uh, how many filings there have been, how many slip opinions. That's in the one-hour version, so I'm going to skip over that and just tell you we're very, very busy. Um, Okay. Uh, in terms of jurisdictional cases of interest, uh, what I tried to do was I created three categories. They're my own categories and nobody else uses them, but they were helpful for me for doing this, so here they are. The first are the notable or the unique, so cases that I think are notable or unique this year dealing with jurisdiction. The second category um, are the mistaken, uh, meaning they're just in the wrong place or maybe they're in the wrong place. And the third are the misunderstood. They're in the right place, but something has happened. So the notable. For the notable, I thought a really interesting case this year was disvintage. And I'm going to give you slip-offs rather than um, fed subsites because if you go to our website, again, for the students, if you go to our website, there's a slip-off page. And you can write down the number, which is pretty short, and you can pull up these cases if you're interested in reading them. So this vintage, uh, the slip-op is 18104. Uh, Judge Stansu wrote this opinion. I thought this was notable because it's a protest jurisdiction case. So an importer wanted to challenge classification and they um, did that through a protest and then they wanted to challenge the denial of the protest uh, at, in the court. Okay, that seems fine. What was the problem? The problem was that when you protest um, uh, something, you need, in order to get into court, you need to have paid all the duties, charges, and exactions. And unfortunately for this uh, importer, and I always think unfortunately for this attorney, that <laughs> they failed to pay $26 of the amount of money that was due. And I think the amount might have been something like $10,000. And the saga of how, it failed, how they failed to pay $26 can be found in the opinion. 
in any event, they didn't pay $26. And there's a statute that says, in order to have, basically in order to have jurisdiction under protest jurisdiction, you need to pay the money. Um, and so the case was dismissed. And I think that's notable because first you, you read it and you say, ooh, that, that hurts. Um, although, you think about it, that same statute applies to the case where the duties may be $200,000 and you just don't have the money to pay it, right? Um, that hurts too, right? Um, presumably they had the $26 and they just made a mistake. Um, but it's jurisdictional, it's a condition precedent, you have to satisfy your condition precedent before you um, get into court. Yeah, I think it's a good case to talk about when um, talking to students because the little things matter. You have to be careful about these things and jurisdiction uh, is unforgiving. So um, you have to cross all your T's and dot all your I's. The other two cases that I thought were notable and that I recommend for your review but I won't go into um, are the NROC v. Russ, slip op 18100. That's a um, embargo case, so the under subsection I, jurisdiction dealing with embargo. Um, it's interesting um, because it's dealing with the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, <clears throat> this is one of those cases where um, the Marine Mammal Protection Act is protecting certain protected uh, uh, porpoises or small dolphins here, and um, the uh, plaintiff sought an, an embargo and an injunction against the importation of fish caught with technology that was not um, comparable U.S. technology that protected um, uh, these mammals. And um, it's an interesting opinion to read, uh, especially for the uh, APA analysis, I thought, and the standing analysis, so I recommend it to you. Um, another interesting uh, set of opinions to read and that probably might be discussed today looking at the uh, program are the Tobacco to Wilson opinions, Judge Rustani. Uh, slip up 1881 and 18138. I think these are interesting to read. These are also I cases. Um, I think this is a really interesting topic uh, dealing with when Congress tells an agency, and could could be any agency, but here this is dealing with drawback regulations. Congress tells the agency you need to write regulations, and this is when you need to do it by, and then the agency isn't getting it done in time. The reason why I think that's fascinating, and I will say the very first case I had on the court dealt with this, and so uh, I, I, as an administrative law geek, I, I think it's thrilling, you know, because there's a really interesting question about the um, separation of powers um, and the role of the courts and the role of uh, uh, Congress, and so I recommend both these opinions. One's a preliminary injunction, dealing with preliminary injunction, um, then 138 is uh, uh, dealing with the, the merits. Um, so I recommend both these opinions to you. Um, I think they are definitely notable. Okay, so that's the notable category. What about the misplaced category? So um, for misplaced, um, I'm talking about something which, if it's not in the CIT, it should be somewhere else. Um, and then the remedy is, or at least one of the possible remedies, uh, are to um, simply transfer it to district court. Now I had a case like this I'll mention it quickly, a couple of years ago, uh, the slip-op is 1698, dealing with TAA. Um, and so our jurisdiction under the Trade Adjustment Assistant Act, those involve cases where uh, employees have um, been displaced by trade, have lost their job, and they can seek special benefits through the Department of Labor if their group is certified for those benefits. If they, the Department of Labor fails to certify them, they can appeal that to our court, and we have jurisdiction over that. This case involves someone who um, had already been certified, but after the certification, the benefits are actually administered by the states. And this is, if you read the opinion, it, things went horribly wrong. And this person was seeking redress for not getting all their benefits. Unfortunately, they came to our court, and that's not within our jurisdiction. Apparently, he never received the, the, the notice of, that he had been certified, that he was in the group. Yeah, it was, it's a horrible case. And actually, if you read, uh, most of it's in my opinion, where I happen to work on this, um, he actually was his own lawyer and went above and beyond the call I mean, he, to, to get his benefits. He brought his own case in Connecticut State Court and the state court said no. He actually had to go and get the federal government to explain to the state court that he 
was entitled to benefits, and then they vacated their own opinion. In any event, it's, it's, a, it's a sad tale, but, but he was coming to our court for something else, and it wasn't within our jurisdiction. Now, we transferred it. That's the answer. You transfer to the, the, he was entitled to go to, um, at least I thought he was entitled to go to federal district court, so we transferred it there. Judge Cho Groves had a similar type case, different area this year, uh, Andritz Sundvig, uh, slip op 1874. This is a case involving uh, the court uh, where the court was being asked to prevent an emergency exportation. The USDA and DHS were responsible for the Plant Protection Act and there was a contaminant found in packaging. The plaintiff tried to claim a jurisdiction saying it was protesting the exclusion, but the exclusion was not under customs laws uh, as the protest statute would have required. Um, and therefore, the proper place was to go to federal district court, and the case was transferred to federal <coughs> district court. So there are times when we just don't have jurisdiction, even though you might have thought, well, maybe you do, but the answer there then is to transfer it. One other case, or it's a pair of cases to mention that are a question of whether they were mistaken jurisdiction, uh, but it, it turns out they weren't, um, are Maverick Marketing and Gateway Imports, slip-op uh, 1883, I'm sorry, I only have one of the slip-ops there, but um, they, the, each of the case cites the other. This was a question um, of whether the um, government could bring an action to collect unpaid federal excise taxes in the Court of International Trade. So the government was just seeking the payment of the federal excise taxes that were due upon importation. They were not seeking a penalty, although they could have sought both at the same time under 1592. But they just sought the payment of the taxes. The problem is, is that the statute says recovery of a civil penalty, recover on a bond, or recover customs duties. That's the jurisdictional statute. The 1592 statute talks about the recovering of either penalties and or taxes and duties. And so the question was, does the jurisdictional statute um, reach just the collection of the excise taxes and not, um, the not, not, not asking for the penalty. That's right, not asking for the penalty. And the answer was yes, um, and uh, on two grounds. One, that, um, that uh, if you read 1592 in conjunction with it, um, <coughs> that that was the proper interpretation, that you would also reach the uh, taxes, and secondly, that for purposes of the jurisdictional statute, the excise taxes collected at importations were considered customs duties, and there was some prior case law on that. So, um, but had it not been the case, you would have to have the collection of the excise taxes in district court and the collection of any penalty for the same thing mm -hmm. in the CIT. Okay, how am I doing on time? Not so good. You're doing fine. Okay, well, let me get to the last group, um, the misunderstood. So um, the misunderstood is where you, you, you should be in the CIT, but you've gone the wrong jurisdictional path, and um, that's a problem because either the, the time has passed for the other jurisdictional path, or you failed to do something that would have been required for the other jurisdictional path. Obviously, sometimes people file papers, belt and suspenders, and do both. That happens. Um, but when you don't, you can have a problem. So uh, one case is an example, Hor Liang, uh, slip op 18-124, Judge Barnett case. Um, here the plaintiffs, um, oh, I'm sorry, I meant, uh, I want to give you another one, National Nail, also Judge Barnett, 18-125. Here the plaintiffs um, uh, wanted to challenge the all others rate in a dumping case. So that's the rate that applied to all the other importers who wa weren't individually examined. Um, they did not participate in the underlying administrative review. They thought things were going their way. They didn't see any problem. Um, and in the final decision, the agency changed the all others rate, and now they wanted to challenge it in court, even though they hadn't participated below. Participating below is a prerequisite to being able to challenge in court under subsection C. Since they didn't participate under subsection C, uh, didn't participate below and couldn't take <coughs> advantage of subsection C, they tried subsection I. Um, and the court said no. Um, you could have participated below. You should have been alert to know that it was possible 
that the all others rate could be challenged. You should have been following along. There were definitely challenges in the briefs below at the agency. Um, and you should have just gotten your name in there and participated, and therefore you cannot bring a case under I. Um, and lastly, um, for the misunderstood case, an example is the Supreme case. And I'm intimately familiar with this because this is a case about the Court of Appeals reversing me. Okay. So um, in Supreme, the importer had challenged customs, um, what it perceived as customs excessive, um, or extra statutory decision to um, put their goods in the scope of an anti-dumping case. So they came to the court and they said, customs is act acting beyond its authority. This is an I case. We'd like you to invalidate what they've done um, as uh, ultra virus. Um, I found that they did have um, I jurisdiction to make that claim. The, um, uh, the Court of Appeals said no. If what they were complaining about was being in scope, then they should have brought a scope ruling first at the Department of Commerce and then um, challenged that um, in a proceeding under subsection C and reverse me. Now, implicit in the Court of Appeals decision, I think, is that what they're saying is Customs does have the authority to put you in scope. Um, and that brings up a question that Judge Gordon and I chat about all the time, which is, when is something a failure to state a claim, and when is something a jurisdictional issue? Um, and, uh, and, and so I think that case is interesting and, and, and definitely worth reading. OK, so I have time to do a couple little things on procedure, or am I done? But you would just say yes anyhow. Um, OK. Three minutes. OK, I'll give you, two, well, I'll give you some cases uh, to, to think about. So well, first, I want to tell you that our rules track the federal rules of civil procedure. Um, but they're, um, they don't always uh, follow them exactly because we're a unique court, we have unique issues. To, um, to modify our rules, we take advantage of an advisory committee, which is populated by people in the bar, whether they're, and I'm sure many people here in this room have been on that committee, um, people who are either representing bar associations or from customs, from the agencies, um, from the customs side of the practice, from the trade side of the practice. Um, and so, uh, an example of one of our rules that is uh, a little tailored is intervention, because um, even though you can intervene by statute, um, you, um, uh, our, our rule talks about having participated in the uh, underlying proceeding. Um, there are a couple of cases worth looking at. One is Hitachi Metals. Um, that, in that case, um, uh, the uh, parties, prior to the court being um, Prior to the case being assigned to a judge, the parties had all consented to the intervention of uh, a company that had participated in the ITC proceeding below. But it had participated with respect to um, an order of merchandise, uh, affecting merchandise from Germany, even though the Hitachi case involved merchandise from Japan. But the ITC was going to accumulate um, the findings. So Judge Barnett uh, vacated the intervention, saying that each proceeding, each ITC proceeding, stands on its own, even though um, there was accumulation of the imports. So um, that's worth reading. Another case on intervention. Germany wasn't an investigated party, therefore you. It was in its own proceeding, and said so. It's not in. It's it's not it's not part of the the Japan proceeding here. Another case worth reading. I'll just give you the slip up, uh, 18-41. Uh, dealing with uh, the 232 cases, domestic... Uh, uh, um, domestic security tariffs. Right. right. Um, okay. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll stop there so we can talk a little bit. All right. So just uh, thank you, Judge... Uh, oh, uh, actually, I do want to tell you one sure. last thing. I'm sorry. This is important on procedure. Um, the, um, I think one of the issues that's coming up now at the court and that the advisory committee is dealing with, um, just to alert you to this, is that in all of these proceedings, there's a lot of business proprietary information at the agency level. And you can understand why, given the nature of the inquiries. Um, and so what happens is this information is all designated confidential in the um, briefing to the agency. Um, and that 
comes up to the court. And a lot of the information that we're discussing is confidential and it's bracketed. So you will routinely see two different opinions, right? The public opinion and the confidential opinion. The problem is, is when you are trying to write an opinion that explains why something is not supported on the record by substantial evidence, sometimes you have to talk about the numbers or the suppliers or the corporate structure. And that information has been designated confidential, sometimes years before, and it may or may not be confidential anymore, but it's very hard to get people to focus on saying, can you make this unconfidential so I can write an opinion that people can read? Um, and we try very hard at the court to at least keep the above the line opinion readable and put everything that's confidential below the line. So if you can't read the footnotes, okay, because it's blacked out. Um, but it's a challenge, and part of the problem is I always send out letters to the party saying, by the way, if you can unbracket anything, please do. Nobody ever unbrackets anything because what's, I mean, what's the safe way to go? No, it's good. We're good. You know, I mean, you don't want to take the risk of doing it. We understand that, but that's a big problem, um, and I know at least in one case recently I said, I know you can unbracket something because I can read it somewhere else. So please take a second look. And the parties did. So I think you'll be hearing more of that from the court to really make best efforts to see if something really is still confidential. Because we really do have to write opinions that people can read. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, uh, I was uh, at one point APO czar in my firm uh, <laughs> in Old Dewey. And uh, that is not a gift that I did not appreciate having. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> you should define APO. APO is Administrative Protective Order. It's all these business proprietary information during either uh, you know department. JPO it's, it's if it's within the courts, you know Judicial Protective Order, and uh, under if a proceeding is before the the, the trade agencies, uh, the Department of Commerce and the, Internet, the U.S. International Trade Commission, uh, the parties, the lawyers, between petitioners and respondents in AD and CVD uh, proceedings, they get to you know, get precise business uh, proprietary information from each other. The clients don't, but the lawyers do, so they can argue the cases. Everybody, I mean, uh, under threat of going to prison and being disbarred, uh, you cannot goof off. You cannot basically disclose information that's business proprietary. So it's an enormous responsibility, and the sanctions are uh, uh, potentially, I mean, you, your firm can suffer sanctions too. So it's a, it's a big concern. So lawyers tend to be very risk averse. Right. You know, and again, I mean, so why would you ever take a risk on something, right? But you know, um, it's we have to find a way to deal with it because, in some opinions, it doesn't matter, and, and you can just put things below the line. But sometimes it has to be above the line in what you're explaining, and then you have these big holes. Above the line means I mean, stuff that that is not bracketed. That's right. not. No, I mean, above the line. I mean, not in the footnotes. Closed. Not, not in the footnotes. Footnote. So hopefully, people can read the opinion and make sense of who did what to whom. Mm -hmm. But when you have huge, you know, you have to every other line that's blacked out. Out, that's really, it doesn't mean anything. And I try very hard to write my opinions so that law students can read them, which, you know, I, if you read my opinions, you'll see that I have a lot of footnotes. You know, some people may be sick of reading my AFA footnote, what it really means, you know, but I put it there so that someone who's picking up a trade case for the first time can follow along because we have a lot of kind of inside baseball um, stuff going on. So in any event. Right. That's, the, the, that's very important because it links to my, uh, the, the point about the students. Uh, the reminder uh, to the stu students present and, and to those lawyers, I mean, the people who are not currently practicing customs or trade law who are present who might be interested in, and is th the notion that all these uh, civil procedure, you know, uh, provisions that the judge talk talked about, intervention, uh, 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 filing in the wrong court, uh, residual jurisdiction, you know, uh, the fact that not all residual jurisdiction, residual jurisdiction is not necessarily a catch-all. All these things and the, the, the powers of the, of, the, of the Court of International Trade to, you know, engage in 28 uh, U.S.C. 1631 transfers to cure, you know, uh, 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 bad jurisdiction. You don't have jurisdiction. The federal courts have that authority. All that stuff that students learn in the first year civil procedure class. That stuff deeply matters in practice. The first thing you go, every judge goes through is you know, finds out is whether we have jurisdiction to hear this case. And uh, so all that stuff that you learn in that first year, a civil procedure course on subject matter jurisdiction is deeply important. It's going to be applied to a specific context. But all those instruments, all those tools for the federal judges have, they will deploy. 
So having said that, so don't forget your civil procedure, uh, stay uh, current with it. So having said that, uh, under the notable Judge uh, Kelly, you mentioned uh, this vintage case, the, the challenge of, the pro uh, of protest uh, decision, uh, denial of protest. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, the question was the, the, the plaintiff failed to meet a statutory requirement for uh, you know, having the case heard before the court. Uh, <clears throat> as, you've as you've indicated, the CIT rules mostly mirror the Federal Rules of Procedure, besides uh, providing that as a default rule, all involuntary dismissals, quote, operate as an adjudication on the merits, which is what rule, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 41B on involuntary dismissals provides. The rule, uh, the Federal Rule of Civil Procedure provides, uh, exceptly, ex expressly accepts uh, dismissals uh, for lack of subject matter jurisdiction improper venue, I mean, and there's a, a couple more. But the federal rule expressly uh, uh, accepts them from uh, being considered uh, 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 dismissals on the merits. And that's very important because of claim preclusion, obviously. So uh, when you look at the at CIT, the CIT mirror rule, well, it's not exactly that uh, a mirror, CIT rule 41B5, uh, you see that those exceptions that you see in the Federal Rules of Procedures are not there. Two questions. Why doesn't the CIT mirror the FRCP and expressly provide that involuntary dismissals for lack of subject matter jurisdiction are not educational demerits? That's the first part. Why, why did they do that? Why did the advisory committee do that? And second is, there's a case, a 1961 case, Supreme Court case, Costello, very rare case. The, the rules in the, in the early 60s said you know, uh, the exception identified in the involuntary dismissal uh, uh, provision of the federal rules was uh, except for dismissals for lack of jurisdiction. It didn't refer specifically to subject matter jurisdiction. And Costello adopts this rare, broad interpretation of a jurisdictional rule, and federal courts or judges in general are very reluctant to uh, interpret uh, jurisdictional uh, rules broadly. But in that case, they, the court basically found it made sense to interpret lack of jurisdiction as including subject matter jurisdiction. And then as a result, later on, the federal rules were updated and today they have the language they have. So my question is, if the reason for the advisory committee and for the CIT adopting the mirror rule, the rule rule portion of 41B5, mm -hmm. and not the exception, but not copying that the exception, right. uh, was, are they relying on perhaps on a reliance on Costello? Is that reliance appropriate? Because the rules are textually different now. Yeah. And how how can you? Uh, Costello is about a rule that said lack of jurisdiction. The CIT rule says no nothing. Right. So. So you know, I, I don't know the answer for sure. Um, I can guess that the uh, you know why it was changed the way it was. I can guess that um, the uh, the provision um, under 41B5, I think it is, um, talks not just about jurisdiction, but also failure to join a necessary party and venue. Mm -hmm. And since we're a national court, we're not going to have a venue issue. I can't imagine where we'd have a Rule 19 issue either. So, so it might have been thinking, you know, maybe we don't need this provision. Subject matter jurisdiction, though, um, uh, I've always thought, and I taught procedure, both state and federal procedure, and the New York state rule has the same type of issue, but I always, whenever I taught it, I always thought, well, if you don't have subject matter jurisdiction, so for us, how can we ever have anything on the merits if we don't have subject matter jurisdiction, right? Well, how does that get on the merits? We don't have jurisdiction, we have no power to say anything. So that rule's always kind of bothered me a little bit. Um, sorry, sorry, but um, so, so I can guess it's, it's that, well, our court was different, our jurisdictional issues are different, and we don't have a venue problem, we don't have a Rule 19 problem, so we didn't need it. Maybe that was the thinking. Um, uh, but I am going to bring it up to the Rules Committee. <laughs> Just to, to My question it. goes to, yes, it makes, it makes total sense. Of it. it makes total sense. Uh, a dismissal for lack of subject matter jurisdiction is not an adjudication on the merits, so it has no claim, claim preclusive but effect. I you, you know, the, but the problem is people will try. Right. Like, a, let's say it's sure. a, a defendant will basically say, oh, you've tried this before, and this was... Well, and actually, I will tell you, you know, I hadn't thought of it at the time, but when I had that TAA case that I transferred, one of the reasons why I transferred it was because... 
I wanted this person to be able to pursue their claim. And, and for that, for that, or I thought it was fair that this person be able to pursue their claim. But, um, and I think that, you know, the, the answer for this, for litigants is, you know, make sure you, you fight over whether it's with prejudice or without, right? Cause, and it also says, the rule does say, unless ordered otherwise. So you can always ask the judge, look, you know, if you're going to dismiss us, this has to be without prejudice. We have to be able to fight this, fight this another day. And certainly you want to make that clear. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have one final question, then I, I'll transfer, I'll pass to the audience for questions. It's, uh, it's about the, uh, the use of Chevron in the, tra in, in the trade area. Uh, I use Sur America de Aliaciones. Uh, it's a, it's a 1992 uh, Federal Circuit decision by Judge Prager uh, that basically, uh, I mean, uh, uh, gets cited all the time as being like the the Chevron equivalent, you know, in the in the trade area. And Chevron gets cited too. But uh, I don't want to go into the details about the case. I just want to uh, ask a question about the, everybody here probably has heard of Chevron. My students here, uh, uh, I mean, I have, I cover Chevron and I do both Sur America and Nucor, the 2005 case. So uh, I'm trying to kind of get my students to pay attention here. Okay. So everybody knows Chevron steps one and two. There's this academic debate on, on step zero. Right. Uh, but my question generally is, does Chevron deference tempt judges too much into accepting divergent meanings or arguments that there are, that sp specific statutory uh, provisions have divergent meanings, and then uh, to then concluding that Congress did not speak directly to the issue, which so that they get to step two. It doesn't tempt me. <laughs> um, so I will tell you. So my my feeling about Chevron is, which I think is fine and right, uh, but uh, my my pet peeve about Chevron is it's not a magic wand. To me, what Chevron says is that Congress sometimes delegates a decision to the agency. And if it has delegated that decision to the agency, then the agency makes a reasonable determination that even if I might make a different, a different determination, I should go with the agency. First of all, I think that's consistent with our standard of review. I think it's consistent with the APA. Um, if you want a doctrine to do it, okay. Um, but what, what I think is really important is you have to do the work. So has there been a delegation? I, I despise the word gap. I, I don't know what that means, gap. right? So some, I've actually had people argue to me at, at all points in my life, when I was in practice, when I was an academic, and now in, in, in briefs. Well, you know, the agency said, uh, the Congress said you can do A, Congress said you could do B, um, Congress didn't mention C at all, so that, that's a gap, and therefore the agency can tell you what you do. I'm not sure that's right. I think that you have to say, where's the delegation? So if you have broad language, like in the new, it was in the new court case, where it's um, uh, by reason of, mm -hmm. by, right, by, by reason, reason of imports. Imports. Okay, so why is that a gap? That's a gap because that's, you're basically saying there's some sort of causation here. There's a whole range of causation, right? There's but for causation, there's proximate cause causation, right? So Congress clearly said, we want you to do a causation analysis, and we're not telling you what it is. And given the rest of the statute, and given the fact that you're the agency and you do some really complicated things, that's a delegation. Like, I'd like to see that, right? I like to, and I try and write that when I write a, sh when I cite Chevron, that this is a delegation. The fact that, you know, you don't see anything, I don't think, is a delegation. Um, it may be. It depends on the rest. It's very contextual. Um, and then part two is, why is it reasonable? Because, it, because the agency did it doesn't make it reasonable, right? It's reasonable because the statute has these goals and these other provisions, and you can logically connect what's being done, and you can foresee that what's being done is fulfilling these purposes. Why? And you give me all the details. Then it's reasonable. So you agree with Justice Kagan that says that we're all textualists now. <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I, I'm not a big fan of labels, so, um, and I, you know, and I'm not a big fan of the, and so the reason why my clerks, you know, I think sometimes think, you know, she doesn't like Chevron. I'm like, I don't, I don't dislike Chevron. I just, and I, and none of this is a secret because I've written several articles on it. Chev, Chevron is the law professor's friend. It's your way to get tenure. And, um, <laughs> and so, and so you, you, I just want you to do the analysis. Show me the analysis. When I was in practice one time, I was in a discussion with somebody, and we were having a back and forth about whether customs had the power to do this or that, and they just kept saying Chevron to me. And it was a question of statutory authority. And I thought, 
that can't be right. It doesn't, the Chevron isn't saying, go, go forth and do well. It's mm -hmm. saying when Congress delegates, so I prefer the word delegation much more to gap. Do, do we see a delegation? And by the way, I think for you know, our agencies, particularly the, the trade in the, on the trade side, there's tons of delegations. There's lots of things that Congress has said, you know, Commerce will figure this out, the ITC will figure this out, and that's, that's perfectly fine. Last we eat up into all our break time, I would like to invite at least two questions from the audience to Judge Kelly. Especially if it's a student question. Yes. Although it's not, it's okay. <laughs> yes. So you're on the court of uh, seven judges, right? When you decide an opinion, how much do you think of what the other judges might decide in terms of writing, or do you just focus on this is what I think? You know, oh, that's, that's a great question. So I will tell you that um, I, I want to figure out I, I want the right answer, you know? I want to be able to go to lunch and f with the other judges and feel like, don't worry about it, I got it. Um, but that being said, um, I, some judges on the court will circulate their opinions and um, to see if somebody says, you know, wow, you really kind of didn't deal with the Chevron problem, right? Or, yeah, you know, sometimes people will say, well, that, I see that as a real weakness. Then you want to go back and make it better. The other reason why you want to um, circulate uh, an opinion um, is so we all know what we're doing. So, for example, a colleague and I recently had two opinions com come out uh, on a scope issue that it, it pretty much is the same issue, and we did, dealt with it slightly differently. Um, and, you know, I really thought about what my colleague did and whether, whether I could do that. And I just, I just dealt with it differently. But I dropped a footnote and said, you know, I know this is out there and I'm doing it just a little bit differently. Or, you know, sometimes you want to be able to say, look, this is not that case. I know it's there and it might look like that case, but it's not. So, um, so I do care. I, I care very much about the court's jurisprudence and that it makes sense and that, you know, that practitioners just don't think, well, you know, let's play roulette and see who we get. I think you, we, and I think, I do think all my colleagues think that way, although obviously I'm not speaking for them. I actually made a mistake. We actually have more time. We have until 9, uh, 9, 9.30. So, okay. uh, um, I had a question on the, um, the, the gap issue. Mm -hmm. um, Delegation by Congress that Congress has retained? No, no, no. No. I, I think, well, I don't say they retained, right? So sometimes uh, Congress will say something like, um, by reason of imports, right? So I see that as a delegation to the agency to fill in the details of what that means. That's where the gap language comes from. To me, that's an implicit delegation. Um, I don't think you, you ever see an. Uh, well, maybe you do. Uh, it's just that I've encountered several situations where essentially you come up with non-judiciability. Non mm -hmm. They'll say, well... Oh, no, no, that's, 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 that's not this. That's not what I'm talking about, no. But I'm talking about that if, if the... Really, it comes up where the agency might lack statutory authority to do something. And they say, well, you know, under Chevron, we have lots of power. No, you need to point to something in a statute somewhere um, that says that you know, you can adopt this regulation, for example. Um, you just can't regulate where you don't have statutory authority and say Chevron, right? In the, in the new court case, I think, just to flesh out this out to the audience, the question was whether the ITC, by weighing one portion of the POI, the period of investigation, more heavily than the other, other portions of the POI, specifically the, the final year or year and a half or two years, uh, whether the CIA, uh, the ITC, whether the, the ITC basically uh, 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 violated, you know, its, its uh, uh, you know, acted ultra-virus beyond its authority because it's supposed to weigh, it's supposed to look at injury by uh, reason of imports. And so the, the, the plaint, the, 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 uh, the party challenging the, 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 the CIT decision at that point was saying, look, you have to look at the entire POI. You can't make this distinction. And and so the question was then, does the C, the, the the ITC have uh, 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 this power? Is, is was it one of the questions? Was the initial question? I would imagine in a Chevron Step Zero uh, uh, framework would be, well, the agency looks at import uh, at uh, uh, injury by reason of imports, 
And uh, uh, that means you, lo you have a period and you build your record around it. And then within that record, can the agency engage in looking and privileging and weighing one period more heavily than the other? And the, the federal circuit at that point said yes. And, and you know, the, also with the delegation, the delegation may tell you, okay, here's the, here's the range of, um, of decisions, uh, range of possible decisions that you can make and you pick, some among, pick amongst them. But the delegation may also indicate what's outside, what things you can't pick. Right, so I think of it kind of like as a you know a continuum. There's a place along the continuum where the agency can act, and Congress tells us that by the statute. Um, but just because there's some ambiguity in some statute doesn't mean the agency gets to do everything. And 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 really, my beef is really just the explanation. I also I also sometimes would like to see a little bit more of explanation on step two. Why is it reasonable? And that relates to the statute. You do go back to the statute. So, well, what is the statute doing? Is this, is this something that's going to accomplish its goals? So I'd like to see the work done. Um, that's kind of my pet peeve. Judge Gordon? Uh, <laughs> so, um, OK, so if we're, we're talking about procedure, um, uh, just so you know, we have uh, a mediation program at the CIT. And so uh, if I have a case in front of me and I think that perhaps the parties could settle, um, I can suggest to the parties that we refer this to mediation. And um, then it will go to um, another colleague um, under seal. Everything that happens in mediation, I don't get to see. They set up their own docket. And that colleague can try and see if they can work something out um, uh, amongst themselves. Now, I have to say, um, I'll admit um, that when I first came on the court and my friend and colleague, Judge Gordon, um, said, you know, maybe you want to put your name on the mediation docket, I kind of went, sure. And, but I, I really didn't want to. Um, I, I, I wanted to do litigation. I like to go, let's see him fight it out. And, uh, but, you know, I was a new person. And he was a nice guy. So I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And, um, but it really works. It, it does work. I have to say, I've been involved in several, and now I've referred cases. And um, it does work sometimes. So it's, it's probably something that doesn't really lend itself to trade cases. Um, but I've been involved in a couple of customs cases where the parties have figured out that um, they were looking at things a little bit differently and that if they, they moved, moved a little bit, they could work things out. And, and so I, I've experienced a couple of successful uh, runs at mediation. And, and so I would recommend it to you, especially if you're on the customs side of things. Is this something that you judges do under your power under the mirror rule 16, which basically gives federal judges a lot of power to push parties to settle and well, is that I don't know. I wouldn't say it's would you say it's rule 16? I mean I think we just I don't I don't even Assuming know Assuming the rule is the same. Mediation um I think we should do it under the inherent authority of the court. I don't Yeah. I mean it's totally voluntary. We can't force anybody to do it. Um, any, uh, John Bone? Yes, are there any classes of uh, cases where the CIT does not have a high jurisdiction to take a shoot? <laughs> I think, for example, a false claim back cases where the top of the district court said, like, yeah, it's all an incredibly complex anti-dumping law issue. Yeah. Like so um, before I was on the court, I would say yes. And, um, and I know that SITBA was very active in um, developing um, a whole bunch of places where it would make sense for the CIT to have jurisdiction. Um, and now I say no, uh, because not because I don't want more work, but because I just want to stay out of that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in separation of powers, and Congress should figure out what they think they want us to have jurisdiction over, and I should do the cases that are before me, and that's what I should focus on. But I think there's a whole body of work out there of people who have made arguments. And, and you know, when I was more, when I was in practice and I was involved in SITBA, I certainly engaged in those arguments. So. Any more questions? Another question, perhaps from a student? No? And I'm going to stay around all day, so if the students want to ask questions, I'm very happy to, to talk to you. Okay, we have. Without a mic. We, we have uh, five more minutes, and uh, so we could talk about uh, 
Now, one of, of the, uh, the other cases that you mentioned, uh, I was very interested in the, uh, what, what was the case here? No, not this one, Peach. The tobacco, uh, oh, yeah. the Wilson case. Yeah, so that's Judge Rustani case. And as I mentioned, I think this is a very interesting issue for, um, for students and actually a, a possibly a good, um, when students are looking for law review notes, I think this topic about when Congress sets an agency, would sets a deadline for an agency to enact regulations, what <coughs> happens if the agency doesn't meet that deadline? I think it's a very good law review note topic because um, I think that, you know, what the court does, um, it's very it's very difficult for the court to start doing what the agency should be doing, right? And so, but you have the will of Congress saying this is when we think it should be done. And agent, the folks at the agencies, and I know there are people from the agency here, they're very busy. They have a lot of work. They have a they they they. But what is the limit on the powers? Authority to or power to fashion remedies. It's hard, and so if you read, um, if you read Judge both of Judge Rustani's opinions, um, the in the um, in both of them, she kind of you know I, I think you know walks a fine line to try and fashion something um, to get the agency to move forward um, without necessarily. You know, doing the agency's job for it. She can't do the agency's job for it, but she's trying to get them to move forward. And both, in her, I mean, she denied the preliminary injunction because of the lack of irreparable harm, um, but she did fashion a remedy for the agency to move forward. Um, and then in the, in the subsequent opinion, um, she eventually did uh, order a final rule to be published um, by a certain date, but, um, you know, I'd recommend the opinion to you to see exactly what she did. But, so she, but you see, I, I think I see her, you know, trying to, trying to walk that line, which I think is hard to do. Yeah. There's an administrative law case, if I remember well. And by the way, I keep telling my students to study administrative law, because if you want to be a good trade lawyer, yeah, there, you there have is, to know. Other, I don't remember the site, but there was a, there's is another admin law case I used to teach. And it was Chen kind of, Chenery? Uh, no, no, it's not Chenery. Um, but there's another Chen case, Chen I think it was Costal? Is it oh. Costal? Um, no, it's, it's a case that basically uh, uh, an agency uh, has power, has statutory power, but has no deadline, and the agency basically doesn't decide, uh, decides not to act under its power. And that issue is whether uh, uh, you can compel an agent, an, yeah. an agency to act when it has power. And the, 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 it's an admin law case, the, the Supreme Court at that point, I don't know if it was uh, Judge uh, Justice O'Connor who wrote the opinion. She always writes like very good, you know, clear opinions. So that might be the reason I, I still remember this from admin law in, in law school, but uh, and she, and the conclusion was no. The agency can choose not to act. It has the you know it has the authority. It can still be thinking about it. But in this case, Congress fixed a, a right. precise right. And I know there are other admin period. law cases where um, you know similar issues came up in different areas, particularly in, in environmental law, where. Um, the uh, court was faced with the problem of the agency not being able to meet the deadlines and trying to say, okay, and you know, and I remember those cases because uh, in those cases you saw the court walking a fine line too, not saying, you, especially because when the court cannot say you need to meet this deadline, when it's clear they're not going to make the deadline, right? But then kind of pushing the deadline back and saying, okay, you need to get this far by this time and trying to walk that fine line. Um, so there, there are a couple of administrative law cases, particularly in the environmental area, that dealt with this problem. The problem of agency failure uh, to act, so um, you know, the APA provides a mechanism for that, agency, agency action um, denied or unreasonably delayed, um, but that's going to depend on the statute and what, uh, as you say, what's required, how mandatory is it. Do you notice that that comes up more frequently before the court on the, the types of embargo cases than otherwise? Because mm. it's environmental cases, you always have, uh, uh, you know, public interest. Yeah, uh, I don't know. You know, I really have. While I've been there, I haven't seen too much of it. I mean, I think the NROC uh, case that Judge Katzman dealt with um, is the first one we've had in a while, I think. So, um, uh, so yeah. Okay. Well, we should uh, uh, take the advantage of uh, have a nice break. Uh, we'll be back at nine. Uh, uh, 9.45 for our first panel, so let's be punctual and let's have break and there's coffee and let's mingle. Thank you very much, Judge. Thank you. Thank you very much.